Okay. Um, well, without further ado, let's get this thing kicked off. Um, just to let everybody know who's attended so far or who just walked in, um, uh, check out the go to webinar control panel on the side of your screen. Uh, there you can ask questions. So if you do have questions about what I'm covering, please feel free to ask them there or answer all of them at the end of the session. Um, I do have one person online with me right now, Tolu Babalola, who's a head of growth here at Create Joy, and he'll be answering some questions as we go through it. Um, but if you do ask and you don't get an answer right away, don't worry. We're gonna we're gonna reserve about half the webinar's length just answering your questions. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and just close these tabs here, and we'll jump right into the presentation. Um, so today we're gonna be talking about product sourcing for subscription boxes. Product sourcing for subscription boxes is that task of finding products that actually go inside your subscription box. This is sometimes called procurement, um, but really it's just about finding great brands, reaching out to those vendors, negotiating with them, um, and having that all fit to a schedule so it works with your um, oh, excuse me. Uh, so it works with your monthly schedule uh, of packing and shipping and, and that type of thing. So that's the that's the topic for today. Um, the overview is we're going to cover how to find those products, um, hopefully for any niche, presenting and pitching your brand to the vendor partners that you'll establish relationships with, the negotiation process, so how to get the best products, the best prices, that type of thing. And then I'm just going to give you some other just general best practices and standards about procurement or product sourcing that you might not know. So these are going to be, um, you know, some, some basic things that you'll want to know, these different terms and different ideas that um, when you're doing wholesale purchasing that your vendor partners will just expect you to be aware of, basically. Um, so I like to start it off with a quick quote, you know, when it comes to product experience, which is really what we're talking about, um, because with the subscription service, you know, it's going to be the brands inside your box that really create the experience. Of course, you can always have a subscription box where you make the products, but by and large, these are curation services. Um, but, uh, you know, this quote, I think, I'm not, I'm not sure who it is. I think it might have been Walt Disney. I'm not really sure. But do what you do so well that they'll want to see it again and bring back their friends. So basically what this idea is, when it comes to product sourcing and procurement for subscription boxes, this is your time to shine. Like this is, this is why people are subscribing to your services because they think that the experience that you're going to give them is going to be amazing and they're going to want to tell everybody about it. Um, so have that in mind when you do product sourcing. Um, this is this is your this is your time to shine really. So step one, before you start product sourcing, I really suggest creating a sourcing worksheet. Um, so this is just basically an Excel sheet or a Google spreadsheet. Um, I use Google spreadsheets because I can have it updated with my team and I can have other people look at it and that type of thing. But basically, depending on your niche, create a couple of different product categories, and I will give you a bigger example on the next page. And I'll also give you a place to download this too. Um, but you're basically creating a couple of different categories. Um, uh, for product areas, and then you use this to keep track of unit cost, the total new number of units you're purchasing for, shipping costs associated with those products, the retail value of those products, um, link to the product so you can quickly see it, whether you've paid them, whether it's shipped, and whether you have any like future payments. I've got some some kind of unique things in mind, um, including what I like to call the multiplier. And so what the multiplier is, and I'll show you this right here, um, it's this little green cell at the bottom. Um, and this multiplier is uh, how I keep track of, for every dollar I spend getting products in the box, how much retail value do I get out of that dollar? And so, for example, with this specific um, procurement worksheet, we got some hypotheticals in here. But if we spent $19 per box and we had a total retail value of $81, the multiplier would be about 4.07. So every dollar we spent, we got about $4 of total value. So if you want to get that, um, this specific worksheet, um, I give it to all my blog followers for free. So you can go to jesserichardson.com. Um, there you can learn a little bit more about me. And if you drop your um, email in my in my pop-up or in my little sidebar here, um, once a week I send out that product sourcing worksheet, um, which includes this little multiplier. And all these, all these cells are already pre-calculated. All the formulas have been done. So if you're afraid of Excel, I definitely recommend that. Um, uh, so... Uh, so going on from that, I, I recommend starting off with that. While you're just finding these brands early on, it's a good to have some place to keep track of them. So this is basically free since you can use Google Drive to create this. So start doing that. Um, so let's jump back into this. Okay, um, so a couple terms to know, um, and these will be used throughout the webinar and um, definitely throughout your conversations finding products. So procurement, procurement is another word for product sourcing. I think we've kind of talked about that already. PO is just a purchase order. This is like a receipt basically that outlines the product being purchased, quantity, you know, specific ship dates, price. This is not a part of every 
vendor conversation, you, you might not always get a PO or you might not always be asked to provide a PO, but it's just a nice way to keep a record for both parties. I mean, you're going to have some form of record anyways, whether it's, you know, the check or whether it's your PayPal or, or whatever it might be, but making POs for every purchase isn't a bad idea. Um, and it's very easy to create those. So net 30 is a specific term that we use to define a payment period. So if I paid you $2,000 for hundred units, 50% down and 50% net 30, I'd give you $1,000 now and I'd give you $1,000 at the end of the 30 day period. So it's just, um, it's a it's a different payment term basically that you can use in your negotiations to help cash flow for your subscription business. I do this sometimes um, when I have to, for example, maybe order product really high ahead of time. So maybe I have a piece of a product that I want for my March box, but I have to order it now. I might tell them, I'll give you half down and I'll give you half you know, net 30 or net 60. And that allows me to use cash flow from my, you know, my, my months of January and February to pay for product in March. So that's just something to be aware of. Uh, CRM just means customer relationship management. This is basically like an electronic address book, kind of like a Rolodex. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Lead time is the amount of time you want to provide the vendor for production. This is really important when you're dealing with maybe like more boutique artisan brands or soap companies or, or, Honestly, if you're starting to do large orders, you've got to give your vendors lead time. Um, and that term is just used to describe the amount of time you, you uh, provide before you need product shipped. Okay. So, um, you know, notice that we got about 30 more people here. So I just want to really quick uh, draw your attentions back over to the question uh, section in the GoToWebinar control panel. We do, um, we do uh, uh, see your questions coming in. And you can ask questions about procurement and Tolu will be answering some and I'll be devoting my time at the end um, to be answering these questions too. So if you just joined us, please, if you do have questions, you can ask them. They're just on the right-hand side of your screen. You know, I did notice that some people said the audio was a little, um, kind of kind of came out. Uh, if, if one or two of you could just say if you can hear me clearly or not. I want to make sure that you guys can hear me um, before I continue. Cool. All right. Looks like everybody's hearing fine. Perfect. Uh, Great, thank you. Thank you guys for the confirmation. Um, all right, so um, let's talk about finding products. Um, now, this is one of the questions I want to ask you. Actually, is uh, I'm going to launch a quick poll. Um, the poll is how would you rate the difficulty of product sourcing? So this deals with what we're talking about right now: finding products um, on a scale of one to five. Five being the most difficult. What is your perceived um, difficulty with this task? So if you think it's really easy, choose one. If you think it's really hard, choose five. Um, and I just want to get a sense because uh, product sourcing and procurement um, usually, in my opinion, is one of the more enjoyable experiences with these businesses. doesn't mean it's not hard, but I notice that usually a lot of people will think, it's, oh, this is the most difficult. This is where I get stuck the most. I get a lot of emails about this. Um, and so I always like to gauge... Let's see here, I can go ahead and close this poll and I'll share the results with you. So it looks like most people kind of see this as like a three or a four. Um, kind of hard, you know, some people think it's really difficult. Nobody thinks it's really easy. Um, so that's good. Okay, uh, oh, let me zoom back. So let me hide these results. Um, I'm gonna launch a couple other polls, um, uh, but I will wait for that. And let me just get back to my right screen here. Okay, so step one, finding products. Uh, this is gonna be dealing with locating products um, for your subscription box. And I think, like I said, this is the most enjoyable operation. But the main thing you have to keep in mind right now is the expectations uh, associated with customers. So the number one people, number one reason people cancel, um, or probably the most common reason why people cancel um, is because when they get the box, it's just not what they felt like they were going to get. Maybe it's not the perceived value that they were going to get, or maybe they just want to try it, but it just wasn't good enough. Or maybe, you know, they think that for the price they paid, it wasn't really worth it or something. And this all kind of, all those reasons that people might give you for canceling their subscription basically usually all leads back to expectations. If people expect something and you over deliver, by and large, people are never going to cancel. You know, they're going to want to stay with you as long as possible because it's really worth it for them. Um, uh, and so when you're thinking about finding products, really follow through with your boxes. Like, like, like I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, this is really the time to shine. And so what I suggest doing is finding a, or creating a procurement checklist, basically. So this is before you even start looking for products, just write these things down. And if you're on a, if you're on a Mac, 
you can do command shift four and you can take a screenshot or you can do print screen, I think on a PC. Um, and you can get these little, those little bullet lists. So I like to, like to, like to tell people, you know, make sure it fits with your monthly theme. Um, if you're doing a box about, you know, vegan, you know, holiday foods, make sure that the stuff you're putting in actually makes sense with that theme. You know, make sure it um, fits your your budget as a purchaser, but also contributes to the value. So that's kind of like what we were talking about earlier with the multiplier in that Excel sheet. Um, you know, make sure that you're not spending a lot of money on a cheap product, basically. It sounds commonsensical, but I just want to emphasize that. Um, you know, you can... Uh, go through and send business invitations each month to vendors. Um, you know, make sure that you're confirming the total with with uh, total number of products with vendors. Uh, make sure you always finalize that price negotiation. Send up, send a follow up contract. You know, basically take all these steps. Track your products. Track the payments that have been sent. Um, take all these steps to make sure that nothing associated with customer experience and expectations is going to be ruined because a product wasn't shipped or because a vendor didn't do it the right way or because the wrong order or the wrong quantity arrived. Just last month, I had. Um, this really nice item in my box that, um, I needed a certain number of units and they sent me about half that amount of units and, um, they thought that they sent more. So, you know, because I was on top of that and because I knew that that had happened the day I received those boxes, I was able to follow up, get the other product shipped and make sure that my customer experience wasn't going to be significantly impacted. So use this checklist to kind of just go through and making sure that you're, you know, you're checking boxes when you need to. Um, so. More about funding products. Do you need a CRM? A CRM is that customer relationship management tool that we talked about earlier. You can use it, you don't have to use it. Um, a CRM will be, like I said, like an electronic address books. So the one I like to use is Solve360. Um, I don't really use that anymore, to be totally honest with you. Um, I may mostly just use the Excel sheet that I've created. Um, but you know, use something basically to keep your contacts keep track of them. You know, you're gonna wanna make sure that you're not hitting up the same people again and again. And you're going to want to make sure that if you had a conversation about products in the past with a vendor, when you go to them in the future, maybe for a different product, you know a little bit more about their costs or you know a little bit more about their lead time. Um, so definitely choose something that's going to allow you to keep track, whether it's an Excel sheet or whether it's a CRM you pay for like Salt 360. Um, now, when actually thinking about products that you're going to be purchasing, the main thing you want to do is come back to that, the, the idea of expectations. So consider your niche. You know, when you had people sign up for your subscription business, they were signing up for a specific product experience around vegan products or around yoga products or around hunting products. So think of your niche and keep that in mind when actually sourcing products. Um, and then when you think about how do I actually find the products, where do I actually source them from? Um, there's a couple different directions I like to push people. Number one, think about local star stores. Um, you know, find a local retailer who fits your niche. Um, and go into that store and find products. Um, and you can find a lot of great leads there. Um, uh, you know, in addition to that, obviously Google, you can uh, totally sign up for, uh, not sign up for Google, but you can totally just search Google, um, search for products around, around um, your niche, whether it's hunting products, you can use our shop section if you'd like. Um, you know, the downside is obviously you can have a lots, lots to dig through. Um, and so it's going to take you a long time. So if you if you have a if you want to narrow that down, I also like using Etsy. Um, it's a it's great for smaller brands. It's a lot easier to you know sort, search by categories on there. But also you can search by categories on other niche e-commerce stores. So if you're doing natural products, you could totally find uh, great leads on um, Abe's Market, for example, or on a Thrive Market. You know these are just basically specialized e-commerce stores around certain niches, and you can use those as leads. Now, um, I will mention this. So if you're going to go to BassPro.com and source products from there, remember, you're not actually going to reach out to Bass Pro. Um, you never reach out to someone who's like a distributor or someone who is retailing these products. You're going to want to reach out to the manufacturer of the products. So when you're looking at niche e-commerce stores, just keep that in mind. You, know, you don't email Abe's Market and say, hey, I want to buy 500 units of this cocoa butter. Um, that's... Uh, that's not who's going to be selling you the products. So, um, you know, maybe take a screenshot of this screen too. Um, local stores, Google, Etsy, niche e-commerce stores. These are where you find your leads. So if chances are, um, if you are um, already have your idea down and if you already have your niche chosen, you probably know what products you want. I mean, you, you probably really like the products yourself. You probably... Um, 
you don't have a good sense of where you can find them, maybe in your local community or online or something like that, or you you found something that you can kind of you know build your brand around. You found some source, so that's you probably already have them chosen. But just keep these in mind. Um, you know, someone uh, mentioned here, and just because we're so on topic, they said, "Is it going to be difficult to scale your business if you're using artisan or Etsy handmade products?" So Heather, um, the the subscription business I run is called. Uh, uh, is called Prosperly, um, and Prosperly is artisan handmade products, um, and it is it is a little bit harder because I have to give them more lead time. A lot of people in this niche they don't um, they they're not familiar with the, how you actually go about wholesaling and that type of thing. So you have to do a little bit more hand holding here, but it's not inherently more difficult. Um, I mean, Etsy is a great source. There's lots of lots of merchants on Etsy. Um, and you can totally scale a business like this. Um, you know, you can, you can, it's right when you get to about 1000 or 2000 units is usually when you start to feel pain points basically. So if you have a thousand subscribers, um, and you want to reach out to a jelly company or, you know, a chocolate company that's like real art, artisan boutique or a, a, a soap company, you've got to be prepared to give them like five weeks lead time. So in, in that, in those cases, yes. Um, so I just thought I'd answer that real quickly. Um, okay, so let's jump back into this. Uh, okay, so um, another tool that you can use when finding products that I like to use is uh, Evernote. Evernote's a free app. Um, you can, I think you can buy some, some extra features on it, but there's got three cool tools um, that I like, like to use it for. Um, so one is the Web Clipper extension. So this is really cool. So it allows you to save um, web pages basically in a particular folder. Um, and because it integrates with Google, next time you're you know searching Google for ideas or something like that, you can actually see your notes on the right hand side of the search from Evernote. So if you go to Google search and you've been to a website and you've made notes on it, it'll actually show up in your Google search. So that's really easy to search, search through pages like that of Google if, if you actually use that to source for products. Also, Evernote has tagging, which is like a CRM, so you can tag everything beach, if that's your different theme around beach, or you can tag everything around uh, Vegan chocolate, if you're looking for a vegan chocolate one month. There's also lots of other cool add-ons like a mobile scanner for organizing your PDFs, you know, scanning business cards, op optical character recognition. You don't have to get it, but I just like to throw that out there. Okay, so this one is, is dealing a lot with um, a lot of the questions that we've got so far. Who People are, are mentioning like, um, how do I actually, you know, <laughs> reach out to these people? Like, I don't want to cold call a bunch of people. Like, how do I make that initial connection? Um, so I totally understand that. So prior to Prosperly, I had a couple different subscription businesses that I started with my friends. One of them was ConsciousBox, the other one was Escape Monthly. Uh, ConsciousBox uh, was the first one. And I remember thinking to myself, I'm glad I don't have to deal with product sourcing. Like I helped with that, that part of the business, but I never was owning it. And even with uh, the last one, Escape Monthly, I was more involved in it, but I was still like, man, I'm really glad I don't have to be the one doing this since it seems very hard. So for Prosperly, it's a business I've run basically 98% on my own. Um, I, my brother works with me a little bit on it. Um, and one of my biggest concerns was how do I make contact? Um, and so all of you have mentioned that I totally understand that that seems like it's really difficult. I've got good news though. This is actually going to be really, really easy for you. And I'm going to tell you a couple reasons why. Okay. First reason why, if you're going to somebody and you want to buy a couple hundred units at wholesale price, number one, if it's a brand that's a little bit established, they probably already had the experience before. So they're totally used to being talked. They're, they're totally used to talking about these things. They know the process. They have a price ch chosen and they're going to reach back to you and say, they're going to say, you know, Jesse, I would absolutely love to sell you, you know, 300 units at half price. That's just the way it is. People are going to want to sell the products to you at wholesale. Like that's, that's for sure. You're going to get that. Um, and so if you don't think that people are going to be interested in your business because you haven't launched yet, or if it's because you only have a hundred units or something like that, don't really worry about that. You know, anything past 50 or so units, you, it'll be easy for you to get wholesale pricing. Um, anything below that you might, you might run into problem, but, um, the the main idea uh, here is that uh, don't worry. Basically, um, these brands are going to be interested in buying or selling products to you. Um, if you don't want to call them, you don't have to. In fact, uh, Jameson Morris, who runs Yogi Surprise and ships to about um, uh, you know a couple thousand boxes a month, he he does it almost exclusively over email. Um, and so he just writes a short little paragraph and you can see his Jameson's template down here at the bottom. Hi, 
whatever the person's name is. Um, I'm with Yogi Surprise. I'm with the care package for yogis. You know, I'm interested in buying around this many units of this product. I'm curious what sort of pricing you can offer and how much lead time you need uh, to send these out for my August 5th shipment. Um, uh, you can see my pitch earlier, uh, on the top of the page. You know, hi, name, or hi there. I'm interested in placing a bulk order of this many units for this product. I want to learn more about wholesale pricing. I have a with PDF with more information about our company. We'll need the products by this date, and I'm happy to hop on the phone. Um, and so they're, they're very similar. Basically, the idea is uh, short, small, uh, not a lot of text, non-committal. You know, don't ask them for at-cost pricing or don't ask them for free products from the get-go. Um, you really just want to get their attention. Hey, I, hey, I want to buy a couple hundred units, basically, is what you want to say, um, and then give them a date and make sure you, they can do it with that amount of lead time. So another thing here that I really want to mention is conversion rate. Now, you might think about conversion rate in the paradigm of customers. You know, I need to get 100 customers to my web page to get four of them to sign up or, or whatever your conversion rate might be for your for your box service. Same thing applies for brands. You're not going to hit up 10 brands and get 10 brands to give you product. That's just not how it works. They're going to either need too much lead time. They're going to be too, you know, over encumbered with, um, uh, with, you know, other orders or something like that. Or, you know, they might not be interested in your pitch or they might not even reply. So keep conversion rate in mind. You might have to, you know, you know, reach out to 10 companies to get two or 10 companies to get three. You know, usually I see about half the companies I reach out to, I can establish a partnership with. Usually about half of those I say end up saying no to um, because I already got better products at better prices. But just keep that conversion rate in mind. Um, so you might ask yourself, what, about, what do you mean a PDF? Um, uh, uh, you know, uh, what, what PDF should I send them? This is my example PDF. And if you want to grab this, like I mentioned, you can just go to my blog. And this is another thing I send out um, to all my newsletter subscribers. You'll get the first two pages of PDF. Just pop your name into my email, email bar. Um, but it basically looks like this, um, where it's just, you know, I have two or three pages that sh takes a picture of the box and shows some stats about um, about the business, about our subscribers, and why they should be in the box, basically. Um, and so you can attach those to those these brief emails here, and it gives them a lot, gives uh, vendors a lot more information about your brand. Um, um, so uh, let me just check out some of these questions here. It says this this question says, uh, you know, doesn't it help in your case to show them that you know what you're doing and that you won't misrepresent your brand? Um, yeah, totally. That's that's a uh, that's a good point. You know, you always want to come off professional, which is one of the reasons why I suggest having a business invitation. And you don't even have to have a box for this. You could just have products. I used to have products sitting here before I launched. Um, but yeah, you definitely want to come off very professional. And I think the short emails. I don't think that those are unprofessional. Those are the, the highest conversion rates that I see for brand to brand to box is what I like to call it. Um, come from those shorter emails, not from long emails. You know, someone asks here, where can I get that? PDF or where can I get that spreadsheet? That was just my blog, jesserichardson.com. Um, um, oh yes, Jake, thank you for the, the correction of the typo. Peak, not spelled P-E-A-K, but P-I-Q-E-E -E, or Q-U-E, excuse me. Um, so um, okay, so it looks like these these uh, other ones, um, these other questions, I'll, I'll save for the end. Okay, so let's jump back into this. Uh, step three, so negotiations and lowering price. So at this point, we've found our products. At this point, we've reached out to them. We've made that initial contact with them. And uh, maybe we've given them that PDF or something. But now it's time to negotiate and lower those prices. Because ideally, the way you're going to make the, your margins work in subscription boxes is going to be negotiating lower than wholesale. You can totally do it by not negotiating lower than wholesale. And you'll save time by just taking people's wholesale price. But I think you'll find that it's actually kind of easy to get people down on their prices. So... Remember, negotiations deal with the dollar value you purchase the product for. So if you have a $5 candle you want to buy and they said, oh, we'll sell it to you for $2.50, this is where we're going to start to negotiate. Let's try to get that $2.50 down to maybe $2, maybe $1.50. Um, you know, we want to make your dollars work as hard as they can to make sure that your box has value. So keep these notes in mind. Never pay more than wholesale. You are not a traditional retailer. Um, you know, we are not, we're not reselling these people's products in, in one-offs. Um, you know, we're, we're packing them up in these boxes. Um, uh, 
We are, um, you know, paying for shipping. We are sending these boxes to people all around the country, all these people who signed up. We went through a pre-launch phase. You know, we, we're doing all this marketing. We are not a traditional retailer. So if anybody wants to sell your product at higher than wholesale because you're not a traditional retailer, they have their thinking backwards. Um, you know, retailers buy at wholesale price. You know, Whole Foods or whatever will buy at retail price, and then they'll mark it up. And that's how they make their money. We're not marking it up because we're not selling them off in one-off things. We're selling one box at one time. So make sure that's very clear to your vendors. You're not a traditional wholesaler. You send all the products once a month, all in these boxes at the same time. Um, so um, so why does the uh, why does the pitch to consumers matter? Um, and I, I bring this up because um, when thinking about pitching brands, you want to think about pitching businesses. So for example, um, if you are marketing to customers that it's about discovering the best new products or the best new snacks, healthy snacks, then that predicates a relationship for your vendors because you can tell the vendors, hey, um, I've got a, a thousand people who are signed up for a subscription service because they want to discover the best new healthy vegan snacks. And if they think that, and you're like, this is a great target market for you. If these, if my customers really like your product, you're going to have a bunch more customers. You know, um, you're going to have, you know, access to a, a super vetted market of people who have already been put this entire funnel by me. Um, you know, they started off as leads and now I've got them as subscribers and they're literally paying every month to find different vegan products. Um, you know, you tell that to vendors and you say, because I'm doing this for you, I want to pay less than wholesale or, um, you know, because I'm doing some other thing. And I think actually, um, I think actually on the next page here, I have some other, uh, yeah, so here's the different platforms and I'll, I'll jump back to the other screen um, in just a moment. But um, so, so for example, negotiations, if you're, if you're on a discovery platform, so my, my subscription helps people discover the best niche brands. Um, boom, here's your pitch. By being in our box, you can, you know, reach these loyal new customers who want to discover these types of products. If your subscription box is like a replenishment subscription, so maybe you're marketing your box as like shaving things, like you don't have to worry about shaving again because we'll send you razors. Um, being the product that's inside that box means you're going to be part of an ongoing committed experience with customers and you're going to be able to reach them again and again and again to hopefully make them your new, you know, make you their new favorite brand for shaving. Um, creates brand loyalty, creates lots of uh, social traction. It can do a lot of really cool stuff um, for brands that are in replenishment subscriptions. Maybe you're in a super highly niche platform. I curate the best, you know, raw vegan dog food subscription box. <laughs> okay. That's a little bit of a silly example, but you get the idea. I mean, if you're a super specific niche, that's brand authority. You know what I mean? Like if, if the, the dog food you'd include in that box, you can bet the people who actually care enough about raw vegan dog food will probably love your subscription box and love the brands inside of it. Um, so for example here, consider healthy snacks versus healthy vegan snacks or healthy gluten free, gluten free snacks or healthy paleo snacks. All, all each one of these categories, healthy snacks, vegan, gluten free, and paleo, all vastly different niches. You know, the types of products you can include are very different. And the pitches to those brands become better and better because you can say, I work with only vegan products, I work with only paleo products, and my subscribers are interested in only paleo products. So that's the idea there. Um, you know, on a second note, um, you know, ask yourself what else do you offer brands? You know, consider the extra efforts or perks that you might be doing that will move the needle with them. You know, do you uh, do you feature them in emails? Do you take photos of their box? Do you organize product reviews? Um, you know, think about the different things that you're doing um, that provides benefit to the brand, and then tell them that too. Um, of course, uh, you know, tell your brand partners if you need to hit a specific you know dollar mark, then you need um, to get those prices. Don't be afraid to, afraid to play play hardball, even if it's over email. Um, personally, I like to get people on the phone when I'm playing hardball. So I'm like, hey, you know, I really got to hit this dollar mark. You know, I can't spend more than one dollar for this four dollar item or whatever it might be. Um, uh, but I will straight up just straight up tell them, you know, if and if they value the experience, they value the pitch, they'll lower their product costs. Um, so um, you know, don't be afraid to do that. Step four here, follow some standards and follow some best practices. So here are these kind of these, these standards I mentioned earlier that I want everybody here to know. Um, wholesale is, is usually gonna be 50% of MSRP. So if something is retailing for $10, the wholesale price should be about $5. So if someone tells you, oh, I wholesale for $7, they're probably you know yanking your leg 
or they probably haven't priced their product correctly. Um, cost. Cost fluctuates, but generally I found that if cost is about 50% of wholesale. So if you want to buy something for $10, they said my wholesale is $5, their probably cost to make it is around two to two fifty. Um, it depends on their pricing, obviously, but give your you know, that's the range you usually have is another 25% of retail to negotiate in. You know, if you can get if you can get wholesale down to three bucks from five, you might be paying a little bit more than cost, but that's um that's usually the margin you have to work with. You know, that's that's the target area. We talked about payment terms already. I won't go over those again. Um, but just remember, you need to attribute your costs and your correct to correct months and save revenue for it. So if you do use these payment terms, you know, net 30, you're paying, you know, 30% or you're, excuse me, you're paying 50% in 30 days. Just make sure you got to have that other 50% available in 30 days. Um, and don't let that affect your cash flow. So, um, keep track of that stuff diligently in your Excel sheets and your class, in your cash planning sheets. Um, also, I like to just say here, you know, have access to several mediums. If you're just starting off, make sure you have a PayPal account, get checks together, make sure you've connected to bank account, to um, you know, your PayPal and your other stuff so you don't have to wait. If you if you have to pay someone through PayPal and they have to ship it, you know, in a week and, if, and they need to buy product now or they need to buy materials now, if you just set up a PayPal that day or today, it might take you three or four days for that bank account to get cleared. So um, make sure you've done all that stuff ahead of time. And that's just, just generally a best practice that I, su that I suggest. Um, some, some pretty common questions that, that I hear. Do I need a wholesale license? No, you're not reselling it to other dealers or distributors. So don't worry about getting a wholesale license. Do you need insurance? You know, I like to say you should consider it. A general liability of policy can protect you from you know, just some basic product claims, whether it's negligence on the vendor's half, behalf or the product was, you know, just, just you, you never know what can happen. And usually it's pretty cheap. Um, a lot of, a lot of questions also we get is, can I pack boxes in my own house? So maybe I don't want to use a fulfillment center. You can totally do this. In fact, I did it for the first two years of conscious box. We were packing thousands of boxes, um, over the course of a week. Um, you can totally do it. Absolutely. As long as those goods are prepackaged, you know, you're not making cookie mix in your garage. You know, you need to make it a food handling license for that, or you need to be working in a commercial kitchen. Um, but if you're taking prepackaged goods, you know, stuff that's already in a package, and putting it inside of a cardboard box and then closing that cardboard box, that's totally fine. So if you do have a warehouse, do I need to be inspected or certified? Usually not. Some suppliers might require you to do this. Um, I only have one example that I can think of is when I worked with Kraft one time. I can't remember if it was Kraft or maybe it was another brand, but it was a, it was a big brand like Kraft, you know, a big national brand, and they required that the, our warehouse was certified. Um, because they're shipping some type of perishable good. So um, generally you don't need to, but you might run across a brand who asked for that. But the brand who would ask for that is probably a well-established national brand. So if you don't work with those types of brands, don't worry about it for now. Um, so who pays for shipping? Depends on your negotiations. So generally I advise that you pay for the shipping so you can get a better cost per unit. Um, but you know, if you want to negotiate that with your vendor partners, you're totally open to do that. Um, so you know, if you're waiting, uh, to get your first box together, you know, at this point, what are you waiting for? Just do it. You know, it's now's the time to start reaching out to those brands, um, build those procurement worksheets, you know, create your brand invitation, um, those types of things. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just launch a poll right now. And I'm going to ask you if you've done it. So have you procured or have you done sourcing for a box yet? Um, so if you already have, yes. And if you haven't, no. Um, It looks like this is almost done. Almost all of you voted. And if you didn't vote, that's totally fine. I'm just going to go ahead and close this. Uh, I'll show the results with you guys. Um, so about 70% of people have not procured yet. So it sounds like probably a lot of people who are just getting started or, or, or just, you know, doing maybe like the pre-launch of their subscription business. Um, that's really cool. Um, I hope this, this stuff was helpful for you. And if you do have questions, like I said, don't forget to ask, ask them in the question panel. If you did ask a question already, um, we're about to get in the Q and A stage. So if it hasn't been answered yet, it's probably going to be, um, it's probably going to be answered here in just a second. I want to launch one, one more poll while I've got your attention and whether you've done product sourcing already. So for the 30% of you that have, or whether you haven't, this is just what your perceived difficulty is. Um, I want to know what makes it difficult. You know, are you worried about negotiating or are you, are you actually doing poorly in negotiations right now? Um, and, uh, you know, if, if you, um, if you haven't sourced products yet, 
you can also just choose that if you don't if none of these things seem difficult to you but if but if you if you do have a you know an opinion about any of these please choose that okay uh, i'm gonna go ahead and close this poll um thanks everybody for for voting in it oh it just bumped up about 10 percent. i guess i'll give you a couple more seconds um all right perfect so i'll share these results so you know it looks like a lot of people just feel like they don't know what to choose um or uh you know it's, it comes to just being too expensive, they think they're going to be too expensive. So, you know, really quickly, just just to remind everybody here, you know, I want to, uh, you know, remind you of where you can find these products. Um, don't forget, finding these products should be easy. You know, if you love your if you love your niche, which you should, it should be easy to walk into a Whole Foods and find great products. It should be easy to walk into a, you know a Bass Pro shops and find great products. Um, you know, like I said, I really like using Etsy. But even better than Etsy, I really think is niche e-commerce stores. So if you're doing natural products, find a natural product store online that has a bunch of different products that you can check out. Um, you know, like I said, to give you a sense of what this actually looks like, just in case this isn't clear for some of you, you know, let's say I'm doing a natural product subscription box. I want to find products. Abe's Market is a natural products and organic organic goods online store. I can go here, this Abe's Market, and I can go find all these different things that I can potentially reach out to these brands. So if I'm like, I'm going to do a beauty box for natural products, let me check out, I'm, I want to find some different hand lotions for this month. I've got Abe's Market, I go to the hand lotion section. Now I know I can reach out to Thesis, I can reach out to Great Marsh Artisan Skin Care, I can reach out to Nurture My Body, Holly Beth Organics, all these different lotion products um, that I can go and say, I can see here, oh, Nurture My Body, this looks cool. I'm gonna go check out this Nurture My Body lotion. Um, here they are, I go to their website, and then I can say, okay, here's where I can find this, and then I can contact them. And then that's how I find that lead for my natural product beauty subscription box. Um, so I really like niche e-commerce stores. So if you feel like you're having trouble finding those, and you um, maybe don't have any local stores around you, definitely just try to find some niche e-commerce stores that are in your, in your target market. Um, Okay, so here's an here's an assignment for everybody. Um, this should this should read next uh, Tuesday. Sorry about that. Um, so it's January 26th. So on February 22nd, I'd like you all to have a procurement worksheet completed. So you know, go to either my blog and grab this, which was jessierich.com, and I'll, I'll email it to you guys tonight um, and grab this, or make something similar on your own um, and start to fill that sheet out. You know, get some leads in there. Go to a couple different niche e-commerce sites and find some different potential brands. You know, fill it out as best you can. Um, and then going forward, you can actually start to reach out to those vendors and start to have those conversations. Um, but so, yeah, by February 22nd, or excuse me, February 2nd, have that stuff completed. Have a full box put together, basically. Like make a little mox box with six to eight products. Um, and then start contacting those leads uh, for your first or your next box. So for right now, um, I'm going to go ahead and jump in the Q&A section. I'm going to leave up these action item reminders. So these reminders include creating a monthly procurement worksheet, thinking about a CRM like Solve360, um, understanding your value proposition to customers and to vendors. Remember, this talks about the expectations that we talked about earlier. What do your customers expect? And how do what customers expect relate to how that benefits vendors? Um, you should have identified some good sources of niche products. And optional, you could create a business invitation like the one I featured earlier of Cross Release. Which, like I said, if you sign up on my blog, I will also send this to you for, uh, as well tonight. Um, so let's jump into some of these questions here. Looks like we got a few, um, and I, but I think we have enough time. We got about 20 minutes. So, um, so do you have any pointers for approaching vendors about products? Um, so we, we covered this this one. This was this was you, Rhonda. Um, I just want to leave up here. You know, here's this making contact page. Here are these two prompts. Um, this. If you want to look at these prompts more more specifically, go to subscriptionschool.com, go to videos, and then find the um, product sourcing for subscription boxes. This is the same webinar, but uh, recorded at a different time, and you can get the presentation right here. This uh, this URL, you can click this, and you can download the same presentation which has these prompts. So that's subscriptionschool.com, video section, find this webinar. Um, so, you know, I would say, like, like I mentioned just, just earlier, just reach out to them over email first. Get that initial traction, that initial interest. Um, some, someone mentioned here um, about intellectual property with launching a 90s, kind of like a, like a specific themed box around a certain decade. Um, I wouldn't uh, – oh, oh, specifically, how can – what can I include in the box? So if, so, uh, 
James, if you are creating a specific box around a specific niche, like let's say it's, you know, it's a comic book box, you might want to always include different type of Marvel products, or maybe you want to include, you want to custom make some products. You've got to get permission from those people because um, that is their intellectual property. So it'd be like licensing it. Or what you could do is um, you can include those products in your box, but advertise them differently. Don't include specific you know, character names or specific pictures or iconography um, until you get that permission from those people. Now, a lot of boxes do that anyways. So I will say that there's a lot of fan boxes in these like fan club boxes around, you know, young adult novels that seem to just be doing that without really caring about it. So you could do that, although I wouldn't recommend it. Um, I don't think you'd be hit with a lawsuit necessarily, but I would just, you know, I think that's that's one niche in, in subscription boxes that seems very precarious to me. Um, so someone asked here, how do I source products when I don't have thousands of dollars? This is a great question. And if anybody else has been wondering about how I'm actually paying for this, um, uh, I'll cover this right now. So keep in mind, let's say you are, you launch your subscription business on October 1st and you, you ship your first box on October 20th. If you, if you're just starting off your launch, um, you know, you, you're getting all your money from your customers, from your subscribers. When they sign up, a portion of their, subs uh, of their subscription fee is, um, going to be used for paid pro for products. So you want to make sure you have, um, your rebilling happen before, you actually are purchasing products for the following month. So for example, Prosperly's box just shipped uh, last week, Friday of last week. Um, I used my revenue from my end of the month of December rebilling to pay for those products. At the end of January, I am rebilling customers for February's box. In, in mid-February, I'll ship that box to them. So I'm giving myself about three and a half weeks of time from rebilling and for me to get more customers to actually um, – uh, shipping those products, which means I have all those vendors paid definitely by that time. So if you're thinking about that, um, that's the kind of the schedule you want to check out. And if you want more information about that, I would also direct you back to subscription school, go back to the video section. And in this, this, um, this last webinar, how to launch your subscription business, uh, I go over a specific timeline with, uh, product sourcing and uh, it might give you a little bit more information. And actually later today, there'll be another version of the same webinar, which I cover the same timeline. Um, so that's how you're paying for these products. Your customers are paying for them. So just be remember when you're collecting subscription fees, you've got to pay for products with that. But ideally you never actually pay for products out of your own pocket. Um, okay, so let me just re check on these next couple questions here. Um, so, how does someone like me with no business experience get potential vendors to take me seriously? Jay, um, I think we kind of covered this question from maybe it was you earlier, but remember, like I said, make the PDF, make your website look nice. And it doesn't matter. Honestly, I, I really think that, that a lot of people overthink this part. If you're, if you're telling a brand, Hey, I'm trying to spend $3,000 on your product. Can you give me wholesale pricing or better than wholesale pricing? They're going to be like, absolutely. You know, like they've got nothing to lose really. Um, someone here mentioned who do you recommend for box printing? Um, not really super on topic, but if you want to go to the resources section of subscription school, you can find custom packaging and fulfillment options there. Um, so I've been struggled to find as to whether resellers permit is usually needed for subscription box. Um, Monique, no, you don't need this because you're not reselling those items individually. You're selling a packaged product experience. You're selling your own product. Your product just happens to be made up of multiple other products. So you don't need to be a wholesaler's license or a reseller's permit or something like that. Um, because you're not actually reselling individual items. Um, you know, you're selling it, you're shipping a box that says Prosperly on it or whatever your business is named. So, um, okay, so is your example of the multiplayer about four pretty typical? So early in the webinar, we talked about this procurement worksheet and how I like to try to get to, uh, you know, a, a value that I know for every $1 I spend, I get that much in, in value. Um, and someone asked, is that typical? It was four in my example. Um, I think it, that's shooting, that's shooting high. Um, you know, it really depends on the type of product. I mean, it can, it, your, your niche. So for example, if you're doing like a jewelry box, it's so much easier to get it way higher because you might be able to spend $5 on a piece of jewelry that retails for $35. Um, it's, um, it really depends on the product. You know, if you're, if you're working with, you know, toys or something that's like mass produced, you're probably going to have a much higher, re uh, multiplier because all those things are produced, um, you know, at a, at a, at a factory level for me with artisan handmade goods, I usually find a multiplier around three, four, you know, some months I've been up to get, been able to get up to like 4.3, 4.4, get the value really high. Um, uh, so it's a little bit harder with my niche, but I, I think it really just depends on your, on your market. Um, 
Someone asked, how do I avoid having too much inventory? You should never have inventory, Jay. If you're sourcing for 220 boxes, let's say one month, and you end up only having 200 customers, use those extra 20 boxes and send them to bloggers. That's what I do every single month. I have zero inventory. Um, so, uh, so someone mentioned here, it's nice to hear other people are having trouble with procurement. Um, so, you know, uh, Julia just, just, just took this lessons that we're covering today. And like I said, I think it's all about presentation, you know, just present yourself professionally and keep in mind that these people want to want to sell you stuff. Um, so someone mentioned here, how do I get that Excel file? Just another reminder. God, it's just jesserichardson.com. Just, you can just drop your email in the pop up there. Um, if you know your box is going to be late because of vendors or some other things, do you alert your customers? Yes. Um, so Jordan asked this, whenever I'm going late on, um, product sourcing. I always let my customers know. I usually don't have to do that. It's only happened a couple times to me over the last six years. But um, if it is one or two days late, you can do that. Also, if it's only going to be one day late or two days late, you can always print your postage ahead of time and their tracking information just won't update till two or three days later. So you can get them their post, their tracking information and they might not ever, ever know the difference. You know what I mean? It might show up one or two days later than they might have been expecting. But the amount of people who are probably like, you know, buying their nails about your box is probably not the entire group. So that's one other option. Otherwise, if it's going to be like a week late, then I would definitely mention that. And also keep keep in mind how that might affect your rebuilding dates. So how far in advance should we contact vendors? That's about lead time. Good question, Nicole. I usually give them at least three to four weeks. Um, who usually pays for the cost of shipping? Um, like, I, like I mentioned, I suggest that you do so you can get a better cost per unit since shipping products are usually aren't going to be that expensive. You know, you might get a box of I mean, if it's like pallets and pallets of really heavy stuff, yes, but I would say try to, you know, target people who are near you, geographically speaking, or near your fulfillment center, geographically speaking, um, and so you can keep shipping costs down. Like, I can get stuff shipped from, you know, the north of, north Washington, Olympia, to Portland, Oregon, for like 75 bucks, and so if that can get me a dollar off per, for 500 units, obviously, it, you know, it saves me, you know, $425, so, so just think about it in that paradigm. Um, is it difficult to start negotiating good prices um, when there's not a lot of volume? Uh, Sanya, uh, yeah, it can be harder, but remember, keep in mind those other value propositions. Maybe you're doing some other cool stuff for them. Like, um, get them excited. Maybe get them on the phone and say, hey, I've got this really great idea. That's what we're doing. We're, we're connecting you with these types of customers. Um, get them excited. Like, hey, I want to see, you know, this is our budget. Can you work with us? Um, you're going to see a lot of value in this experience, blah, 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 blah. So it can be hard, but not impossible. I think anything below 50 units, it gets, it's almost impossible. So if you're at 100 subscribers or above, um, it should be easy. 50 to 100, it could be kind of hard for some and, and some easy for others. I think that the break, the breaking point is usually around 100 units because that's just a, that's just a large order for any any wholesale order i think because most retailers wouldn't keep you know a, a huge stock of those items on maybe it's you know in the in the realm of 50 or 60 depending on the type of product so anything above 100 kind of i, I noticed changes the conversation someone someone asked here what about drop shipping um you can totally drop ship um just make that a separate partnership for your for your brand partners so for example um you know you have the you can have a dedicated shop right in Crate Joe, you can go here to shop and then you can have specific items here. Um, so if you have specific items that you want to ship people, um, you know, set, set up that agreement with your vendors um, and then they can ship it and you have a commission split or whatever. Um, so someone asked here, um, what about sizes for people's shirts? So those subscriptions kind of focus around clothing. Nicole, it's really difficult to do variations. Um, I find that to be one of the hardest things about subscription boxes to have, you know, 500 customers, Hundred's gotta get this. Hundred's gotta get this. Hundred has to be has to do that. My suggestion to you would be if you're gonna do variations for anything, whether that's T-shirts or something else, get all that information from the very beginning of when they're creating their account. You know, get their sizes, get all that stuff ready right away, um, and then be very diligent with your organization, with your fulfillment center, or in house. Um, it's totally possible. At our peak, we were doing about sixty variations a month for Conscious Box, um, so it's it's a pain in the butt, but it's possible. So someone says I have, a, I have an idea similar to Birchbox. How do I go about approaching large manufacturers like uh, Procter & Gamble for free samples or discounted wholesale prices? Um, I, I don't know too much about that one, Jay. I did free samples with ConsciousBox, and we did the same thing that we kind of mentioned earlier. I reached out to them over the phone or through their email, and I gave them a pitch. Here's how we're giving your brand exposure, and here's why you should give us free samples. Personally, 
I'm not a fan of the free sample model anymore. In fact, I wrote a blog post on CrateJoy about how I think it's, it's it, this, this, the sample to purchase model of subscription boxes is kind of ending. A lot of boxes early on were, were about that model, but it's just so hard these days because so many subscription boxes are trying to get free products. And I'm, I'm personally really trying to direct the thought um, around the industry away from free samples and, and more towards purchasing products because number one, it's easier to negotiate. Number two, it's a better product experience, and number three, it's a lot. You get a lot more responsive um, uh, emails back from vendors. So, if you do want to reach out to large manufacturers, it's just a matter of pitching your business. I would say you better have a, a really nice business invitation, demographic information, uh, pictures of your box, um, stuff that says this is going to be cheaper and more effective than giving out free samples at Rite Aid or whatever it might be, or you know, it's just it's just a nice complimentary thing. So, um, and I think if you do that, you'll find success. I mean, with the really big ones like uh, P and G, like you're, you're going to be able, to, you, they'll probably give you free samples. You just got to reach out to them. So, is there a different way you should reach out to large vendors from boutique vendors? I think we kind of just cover that, but not not explicitly. I think you know, um, everything below, you know, any brand that's not doing, you know, a million dollars a month of revenue for their own products is not a big brand. They're still considered pretty boutique in my mind. Even if this person has an Etsy store and they're filling, you know, a thousand orders a month, they're still a pretty small business. Um, and so outside of like those really huge national brands, it's kind of basically the same pitch for everybody. So, um, you know, just give them a short email, reach out to them a call, give them a business invitation, something like that. Um, so what products have you put in the box that you thought were great, but didn't really go over as well as you thought? So <laughs> this is a good question, Jason, um, because this month, for Prosperly, I made this custom product where I like had like these four New Year's resolution cards and then attached to these four cards as this like really nice expensive pencil. Um, and I was thinking to myself, God, I hope people like pencils. <laughs> um, so I'm going to find out here in the next a week, but I, I haven't actually had too much experience with that. I mean, I think, you know, I've been really diligent personally with procuring nice items for my box and nice items for my niche. There have been times in the past with Escape Monthly that we've included some kind of chintzy type of items, you know, some, some really kind of like, you know, crappy souvenirs for different destinations. And I regret doing that because I did hear back bad stuff. I think it's all about quality. If people pick it up and they think it looks cheap, people are not going to like it. So that's, that's kind of how I think fit in my mind. Uh, what do you recommend when the manufacturers turn you down because they're not having a brick and mortar uh, or a high order amount? Uh, good question, Edward. If they, if they turned me down because I didn't have a brick and mortar, I'd be like, okay, I'll go spend my $1,000 over somewhere else. I'd like, I might literally say that to them um, because it, that, that makes no sense. Um, if they want to put, you know, a thousand units in the hands of, you know, a thousand qualified people, um, give me those products for better than wholesale pricing. If you don't want it, I can go find someone who does because a lot of people will be responsive to that. And telling them that might change their mind. For a high order amount, like I said, anything above 100 units should should move the needle for them. If it's a bigger brand, they might expect more like 500 or 1,000, and so you might just have to forget them and come back to them later. Just remember that for every subscription box, there are hundreds and hundreds of other small businesses making products. So we have a we have a very very vast pool of resources, and we can we can drop a conversation and find another candle maker pretty quick. So if someone's giving you a hard time, don't really spend too much about it, and just be like, hey, if you don't want this opportunity, I'm happy to go find someone else who will do it. Um, and you can just let them go. So wholesale would be typically a multiplier of two or less. How'd you get to four? So um, so this was just an example. Bill's kind of talking about the same sheet here, but basically I try to work them down, you know, as close to cost as possible. Um, I do a lot of extra stuff with Prosperly um, that helps juicen up the offering. Um, and so that, that kind of gets them a lot of exposure. I mean, I, I'm really diligent with following up with them. Um, you know, I, I really like posting about them on social media, holding contests for their items. Um, and for boxes that contain their items. And so I try to do a lot of extra footwork to get that price down. But um, like I said, three, a multiplier of three to five, um, three uh, on the on the low end is what I might expect from my niche. So it's not, this was just an example, keep that in mind. Um, and you might it might be much higher for other niches, like I mentioned earlier. If it's if it's cheaper toys or something like that that can be mass produced, you might have the you might spend five dollars and be able to get like fifty bucks for the toys. And that's totally possible. Um, so would you advise against negotiating on the wholesale price to completely best and then match the competitor's offer? Um, you know, it really depends. I mean, it, it, Jay, that's a good question. So if you have so for everybody else who might not have picked what I picked up what I just said. If you're working with two candle companies, you're going to be a much better price from one. Can you just say, hey, this other person's offering me 
half, half as much. You could say that, but I don't really like playing hardball like that myself. Um, I'm more about saying, you know, I really care about your brand. I love these types of products. I really want to put you in the hands of interested consumers, and I really want to make your, your brand more successful. I want, I, want you to, I want you to not have to worry about marketing for a month. I'll say that to, to Etsy vendors, and they're like, oh, my God, that's the most wonderful thing I've ever heard. So it just really depends on your pitch. Someone asked here, what are some things you know now that you didn't know when you first started with product sourcing? Um, number one, I think, uh, number one, I think it's really just how responsive people will be. You know, if, if you just say, I want to buy these products at wholesale, I was, like I said, I was so worried about people just saying no. Um, basically no one was going to say no. I don't think anybody would ever give me like a hard no, except when we hit a, had a pain point with negotiations. Um, someone mentioned they, that they can't find the, the business invite on my blog. Just keep in mind that's something that I'll email to you. So just drop your email in the email bar. Um, what is... What if I purchase product from a distributor? Can I use their name and branding on my site? Sonia, Sonia, do not purchase product from a distributor. Reach out to the brands individually because you can get a better price. Every single distributor is going to give you a markup because they're a distributor. That's how they're going to make money. They're not going to give you it at cost because they didn't. then they make $0. So I wouldn't suggest working with the distributor. And if you were to work with a distributor, I don't think you'd really get any benefit from listing them their name and their branding on your site. Um, so where do you search your boxes for shipment? I mentioned this earlier. Check out the resources section of Subscription School. Um, okay, is it okay slash profitable to get my boxes made, packaged, and shipped from the States if my business is based in Canada? Ashley, absolutely. If you're getting more customers in the in, uh, United States, you can totally have a fulfillment center based in, I don't know, maybe, maybe Portland, maybe Seattle, somewhere that's close to you, um, and uh, have it all shipped out of there. That's totally fine. Um, it's much cheaper that way too. You know, don't ship, you know, 500 U.S. boxes from Canada and 20 Canada boxes to around Canada. If you have more customers in the United States, I definitely recommend outsourcing your fulfillment to the U.S. So, how do you pitch companies if you have no subscribers or numbers to leverage? Christine, this is a good question. My first month at Prosperly, I just literally spitballed a number. I was like, hey, I'm going to need to order about 50 or 50 to 100 units, I think, right? Maybe it's at 150 units, or I don't know what I specifically said the first time, but I just basically said, hey. I'm going to need, you know, a hundred, hundred of these. And I had no idea if I was going to need a hundred or not. Um, how do you recommend establishing a customer base before procurement? H uh, Holly, um, Haley. Oops. Sorry. I probably pronounced that incredibly wrong. Haley, you should really check out, um, you should really check out these, these, um, these videos launching your own subscription business and the right way to launch a subscription business by Jameson. Um, those are all going to really explain exactly how to get your customer base ahead of time. And actually, just so you know, too, we do have another webinar um, this Thursday for getting your first 25 customers. So if you are looking for, um, if you are looking for some, I think I've mentioned it on here, maybe not yet. If you are looking for uh, um, a webinar that talks more about customer acquisition, uh, you can definitely uh, join that webinar on Thursday. And um, I'll send if you if you join by an email invite, it's in that email. Um, but I'll send another invitation out to everybody that was attending to this webinar, just in case it was missed. Um, so, can you explain what you mean by lowering the shipping cost per unit if you pay for shipping yourself? Oh yeah, Jason, sorry that wasn't clear. I mean, you pay for shipping, so that's not part of your negotiation. So if someone's like, oh well, you know, we'll pay for shipping, but you have to pay three dollars per unit, I would just say to people, I'll pay for shipping, but you pay, then I'll pay for two dollars per unit. Or something that like, you know, make it so the vendors feel like you are covering shipping so they can give you a better cost per unit for the actual product. Um, so what fulfillment center do I use? I use Northwest Paper Box. That's also in the resources section here. It's per touch. So if I have 10 products, I pay for 10 touches. If I have five products, I pay for five touches. So about, I, I usually spend about a dollar per box. So my box is $45. So one forty-fifth of my box is actually for packing. Um, so we haven't formally launched our business yet. Should we begin canvassing for potential vendors? Yep. Do that, do that worksheet. Fill out that worksheet. Let's go. I'm going to come back here. Uh, do this assignment here. You know, build a, I would say about three weeks before you actually launch, you're going to want to have those relationships, you know, locked and ready. Um, how long do you think the subscription box trend will continue? Um, I think it will continue a very long time. And part of the reason, Bill, that I think it will continue a very long time because subscription commerce is not new. Um, we have been subscribing to magazines, to fine clubs, to cable companies, to phone companies to Pandora, to Spotify, to Netflix for many years now. And subscription boxes um, are just another iteration of that. 
And keep in mind too, you can have a subscription commerce for stuff that's not a curation of products. You can make your own soap and have your own monthly soap club and then you know retail those soaps um, on your store. Um, and so because of that, I think it's going to last forever. But um, whether you think about it as a subscription box or just as a monthly delivery of recurring products, that's the paradigm change. Curated subscription boxes like Prosperly, I hope will last, you know, tens, tens of 20, many more years. The last three or four years is when it started to pick up. And I don't think there's going to be a, a bubble anytime soon just because it's such a new idea. Um, I think we've got at least 10 years before we start to see it decline, but I have no idea. You know, who, who really knows? Given the direction right now, it'll be, it'll be popular for a very long time. Second part of the question was, how many players in a given niche do you think you can have before it'll be unsuccessful? Uh, honestly, you only need 300 subscribers, 400 subscribers, 500 subscribers for your business to make a lot of money. Um, and that's one of the other reasons why I think the industry is going to be so um, viable for, for such a long time, because you don't need a lot of customers. I mean, there can be 100 different businesses just like mine possibly, and we can all have 500 customers, and we're only talking about 50,000 people, and there's 330 you know, million people in the U.S. We're talking about a very, very small portion of people that might be in all of our subscription services. If, if there was 99 other businesses just like mine, and we all only had 1,000 customers or 500 customers, we'd all still be very happy campers. Um, so what stage is your brand need to be to approach something national? You know, like I said, just just making sure you look professional. Um, I'm not sure that there's a specific stage. You want to have, you know, probably thousands of units being ordered at that point. What comes first, pre-launch or product sourcing? Uh, pre-launch comes first. About halfway through your pre-launch, you should start product sourcing. So then you do them in tandem. Have you ever tried creating your own brand for subscription boxes? Finding companies to print your own logo on the box to send out? Um, uh, Jenny, yeah, yeah. I'm not sure if this is. Let me know if I, I'm getting this right. So Prosperly is my own brand. Um, so you can see here, this is a branded box and then I have products that I, that I source, that I put inside that box. Sometimes I make my own products that I include in that box or have things custom made for me. Um, and there are, are some very cool brands who make their own products completely like soaps and lotions and different natural products, um, that are, uh, super successful and they do have a branded box. So, so yeah, yeah, you can totally do that. Since you procure artisan products, do you find that they're more expensive? Absolutely. It's a lot harder to make a profit with these with these items. I mean, unfortunately, um, I live in Portland, Oregon, where there's a lot of artisans. And so I, I try to scoot by a lot of costs, like shipping costs, because I try to use local companies. But yeah, it's, it's very difficult. Um, it's more difficult. I'm not going to say it's very difficult. It's more difficult to make bigger margins in my market, for sure. Um, but you can still do it. I mean, I still see 20 to 30% net profit margins each month. So... You know, this last month we did about twelve thousand dollars of revenue. Um, we're at about two hundred and fifty subscribers, and um, we walked away with about twenty five percent net profit. So basically, that means that of eleven thousand, and we still walked away with about twenty seven hundred dollars that we could pay ourselves. So it wasn't impossible. And and if you want to learn more about Prosperly, um, for those of you who are interested, um, you can check out this guide I wrote on subscription school. It's called how I built a business that's made over 50K in six months. This was a couple months ago. I'm happy to say that this month we'll hit 100K. So in 10 months, we did a six figures. But if you're interested in learning a little bit more about this business and how I pitch it and how I brand it and that type of thing, feel free to check this out. I basically completely give away the whole cow <laughs> in this post. Um, but like I said, um, uh, it can be difficult for this niche. I think, I'm, I think I work in one of the harder niches for procurement. Um, but like I said, it's not impossible at all. Can you make a comment about wholesale again? Um, so yeah, like I mentioned here, wholesale should be 50% of, of the MSRP and the cost should be about 50% of wholesale. Um, okay, someone here, do, do you get more success if you ask about a specific product or if you just say, hey, I'd like to include a lotion or a soap, what do you think? Um, I don't know, actually, I think they're about the same. Um, I usually have a specific product in mind since I'm very specific about my themes each month. But um, I, th I bet you could just ask them like, hey, I want to order 500 units of um, this product category. Do you have any products that might fit this theme? They'll probably reply just as, much, just as often. So once you find the product, where do you contact the information for the big stores to ask about wholesale prices? So Keithia, um, and I'm sorry if I pronounced your name wrong, you do not contact the big stores. Don't contact Abe's Market. Don't contact you know, Amazon. Don't contact Whole Foods. Reach out to the brand specifically. If you find um theseus beauty on abe's market take theseus beauty pop it into google 
find their website, then hit contact and say, hey, I'd like to get wholesale pricing or I'd like to get better than wholesale pricing. That's how you find your brands. Don't actually reach out to the big stores. Would you recommend always starting off orders, ordering products domestically? Or would you ever order products overseas from Mexico? Um, I've ordered products from overseas a few times before. It depends on the, the theme for me. But just be sh keep in mind of customs. You might get caught up in customs. So give yourself maybe a week more lead time. I always try to choose domestic just because I like to keep, I mean, a lot of my stuff is like, you know, high quality organic artisan goods. And um, so it's usually like heavier, bigger items. And so I just try to source as local as close to me as possible anyways. Um... Okay, so we already answered that one. Uh, can you use products in a pre-launch campaign even if you haven't contacted any vendors yet? Absolutely. So the worst that can happen is the vendor will reach out to you and be like, hey, why did you put my product in your picture? Um, that's never happened to me before, but I used just random pictures in my my invitation. In fact, you can see here under this post, this initial welcome email, or even the landing page. The landing page, all these brands, I never contacted any of these brands. Um, but I actually... After the pre-launch or during the pre-launch, I did contact them and I'd ask them to buy the products. But to take these pictures or to use their likeness, I didn't reach out to them. And if they would have reached out, I'd be like, hey, it's free advertising. But if you want me to remove you, I will. I, I don't think that they would mind very much. Um, so we built a business of 500 subscribers. We have partners giving us product for free and paying for shipping. In return, we market to about 1 million growing. Do you think this is realistic to continue? Sourcing seems to get harder and harder each season. Yeah, Nate. I mean, I did I did free sample model for a uh, a very long time, and we were doing tens of thousands of boxes a month. It gets exponentially harder. The free sample model is extremely difficult to keep up with. Um, so, get more salespeople. You know, that's what you're going to need to do is get more salespeople and really get that pitch refined so people make those make those sales things happen quickly. Um, but yes, it will get harder. Um, how we how do you suggest we differentiate products each month? Choose different themes. You know, you find, find a specific cohesive theme that makes sense for your box um, and then reach out to them. How many vendors are too many to deal with? Never too many. Um, but like I said, keep that converse rate in mind. You might have to reach out to 30 to get 10. So I'm looking to buy beauty products for my first box. I'm finding that they are too expensive and I'm not able to meet quantities, the minimum order costs. So yeah, get your pitch refined a little bit um, and uh, try to grow your customer base. You know, if you're still doing pre-launch, then estimate higher, you know, ask them about, you know, 100, 200 units. I'm not sure what you're asking now, but try to bump it up, try to figure out what it is, what, what's the, what's the breaking point for those brands you're re reach, working with. So, uh, I create my own product line. Would, would this work on my platform? Shilia? Um, yes, absolutely. We have a lot of really cool people who make their own products who are in subscription boxes and then they sell their products one off through the shop, like I mentioned here. So Creator is a perfect platform for that. Um, absolutely. Um, it's better than Etsy. So this has been very helpful. There'll be more webinars in the future. Yeah, we got another one this Thursday, so follow us on Facebook, and also I'll send out some emails about it. So I'm concerned about quality control from overseas. Um, yeah, overseas is a lot harder, John. Uh, um, but uh, if you are you know, relying on overseas products, um, just like I said, it's usually just give yourself more lead time and pay through PayPal so you can dispute stuff. It's really easy because PayPal is easy to dispute stuff in. So keep that in mind. So how do you feel about going to trade shows? Uh, great. I had a lot of great success with trade shows, finding brands. Um, uh, so uh, I, I totally recommend that. Um, you know, if it's if it's if you're having to pay lots of money for it, I mean, obviously that should factor into it. But there can be a great source of, you know, Natural Product Expo West. Um, is great if you do natural products. I've gone to that a couple times. So how do you pay taxes with your box service? I have an accountant, um, so I don't personally do it. The biggest problem is literally just hearing crickets um, from the larger non-Etsy vendors. How can you get their attention? Call them up, Katie. If, they're getting, if you're hearing crickets, maybe the pitch needs to be shorter. I'm not really sure. I don't really get that experience myself. Maybe optimize your website a little bit. Maybe there's some things that you can do to make yourself appear a little bit more professional. Um, I'm not sure if that's what it is, but it's just a thought. So what's the practice to make sure your boxes don't weigh too much? So Jordan, I, I ship on cubic rates. So I ship cubically, which means it's based on the um, the size of the box, not on the weight. If you want to learn more about this, go to Subscription School and check out this article, The Best Solution for Subscription Box Shipping. You can check out this cubic range. So basically, I'm in cubic point two, so I can ship a I can trip a 15-pound box to zone 8 for $6.30, or I can ship a 5-pound box to zone 8 
for six dollars and thirty cents, or I can ship a twenty pound box. So that makes me forget about uh, weight altogether. Daniel asked, "What's a good price range for a subscription box?" Daniel, you should check out the CrateJoy pricing uh, calculator. It really depends on how much you want to uh, spend on products. Um, someone asked, "How many boxes is a good amount to send to bloggers if you're doing a pre-launch?" You, uh, it really depends on how many pre-subscribers you have. Definitely a handful, though. So it looks like a lot of these questions are turning um, into non-procurement questions. And I noticed that we're just 15 minutes over. Sorry, I didn't even notice the time. Time went over. Um, uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna just quickly go through these here. I'm just gonna kind of fire them off. So if I didn't answer your question, sorry about that. You can ask it on the Facebook wall, or you can shoot an email to me, Jesse at createjoy.com. Um, but I'm just going to answer procurement questions from here on out. Uh, how early do you need to order things typically? Just again, it's about four weeks. Um, I'm not understanding why you don't need a license to sell. You're not, uh, you, you're you still selling a product. Yeah, I mean, you're still going to be registered as a business. You're still going to have an EIN. You're still going to have a business bank account. But you don't need to have a specific wholesale license because you're not a wholesaler. You're not a distributor. So if you have more questions about the legality of how to run these businesses, um, you know, I would uh, maybe talk to a local uh, you know business attorney. Um, but you, you're not a wholesaler and you're not, um, you're not a distributor. So you don't need the, you don't need licenses associated with those things. Even, if, even though you're buying at wholesale, that doesn't mean you have to be have a wholesale license. Um, do you find vendors are willing to give you samples in advance before placing a large order? Yep. Um, do you have any advice for having, a, let's say 20 subscribers and negotiating price with vendors? It's going to be really hard, Russell. Um, just order a little bit more and use those boxes to get you more press and get more customers. How do you get free items and samples in the box? I talked. I, talk, I talked about it already, um, and I don't suggest it. So um, it's just a matter of a really good pitch. So um, looks like here we've answered all these questions. Uh, how do you search a landing page and before you launch? Um, if you're interested about pre-launching, there's check out the webinars in the video section. Um, Okay, can you sell items from your box? If you have two boxes that ship every month and you want to have everybody get the chance to buy something that was in the other box, do you need a license? No, but you can set up drop shipping agreements with your vendor partners and sell so through your store. Um, but you still need to, like I said, you still need to be registered as a business. Um, you still have to have an EIN. Um, you're still going to be paying taxes on those things. So, so yeah. Um, always check local laws. I'm not an attorney. So, um, you know, don't take my advice as legal advice. I'm definitely not an attorney. Um, and it really depends on where you are. Um, uh, but we're internet businesses, so follow the laws that are associated with internet businesses. Um, so, okay. Um, so let me just go through here. Um, okay. Uh, where can I find tell us making my website? Um, if you want to find a contract to send to vendors, um, you can just write one up on your own. You don't really need that. A PO would almost honestly do the same work. So just make a purchase order. It's just like a receipt, basically. How do you know they're giving you their normal wholesale price? You don't ever really know, Jay. You just have to kind of guess. It's about 50% of wholesale. Um, okay, so um, looks like that's most of the questions. Um, if, you, if you're interested more about... Um, if you're interested more about pre-launching and, and the whole schedule, like I said, check out the video section and check out the, uh, the launch your subscription business and uh, and these these other webinars. I mean, how to price your subscription box. Those those will give you more information about the early the early task. It looks like a lot of you are asking a little bit more about the schedule, like how do I actually get my products in on time. So I definitely recommend checking those webinars out. We're, we're over time already, so I can't go into all of that specifics now. Obviously, check out subscription school. We do have some other. Um, guides on there. Also, too, if you go to jamesonmorris.com, this is uh, Jameson Morris's blog. There's a really good, uh, a really good uh, guide here um, for product sourcing. So check this out right here: guide to product subscription box product sourcing. He goes over what he does um, and kind of his schedule, payment delivery, that type of thing. So if you want more about that, check out both of our blogs: jamesonmorris.com jesserichardson.com. Like I said, if you want that procurement worksheet and the brand invitation, go to my blog and drop your email into this email box or in the pop-up that may or may not pop up. Um, thank you all so much for coming for your feedback. Um, when you leave the webinar, 
Um, you will be prompted with a short survey. Please give me, you know, your critical feedback. I, I love hearing what you guys think. You guys have actually made this the number one user resource at createjoy.com for all their merchants. So um, uh, thank you so much for doing that because, you know, uh, we, we've turned these webinars and subscription schools into a, into a huge resource for you guys, and I couldn't have done it without all of you. Um, so thank you so much again. Um, you know, just kind of looking at these um, these final questions here. Uh, let me see if there's any other. I'll go for about three more minutes. It looks like there's a couple of people begging me to answer their questions. <laughs> okay. Um, someone said, is it okay to charge vendors? I would never charge vendors um, to be featured in the box. I mean, that, that seems like it'd be difficult to negotiate. Um, uh, okay. Um, okay. Blah, 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 blah. Should have curiosity. Okay. So have you run into the problem of retail license? No. Um, I've never had anybody ask me for a retail license or wholesaler's permit. So that, that question came up again. Um, Rick, I use Stripe. For my credit card processing, um, I haven't ever queued, uh, uh, included digital products, except that's not a bad idea. Um, do you always sample items first? No, I don't. If they look great, I'll just kind of assume that they are going to be great. Um, I it's, it's a good idea to create your own products. You can totally save money on that, um, but you don't have to create your own products. Who does my packaging? Northwest Paper Box. Um, can you do a subscription box slash gift box together? Totally. I also sell gifts at, at Prosperly, so you can absolutely sell gifts alongside your Dumble subscriptions. Um, can you product source your main item now um, until you've established and eventually you start making your own? Yeah, absolutely. You can totally do that. If you want to start you know, having a collection of different brands and then do your own products, I think you could do that. Um, I don't see why not. I might communicate it to customers and maybe always include like a piece of chocolate that's made by somebody else or something, but I don't think that's a bad idea. Um, yeah, companies respond well to getting, getting products from one company in multiple boxes. I've, I've refeatured, refeatured a couple brands on Prosperly and no one's ever said anything about it. You can use a rigid box and a mailer for a subscription box. Absolutely. Your subscription box does not actually have to be in a physical box. Um, uh, to get a copy of the discussion, you, this, this whole webinar will be on subscriptionschool.com under the video section. Um, okay, two more minutes here. Um, how many box sizes do you have? Prosperly has one. Escape Monthly, the business I sold last year, had three, a mini, a normal, and a luxe size. And then Conscious Box had um, two sizes, a mini and a normal. And there's gluten-free, vegan, and normal for each one of those. So there's six total variations for that one. Um, so still hazy on the customer service and legal tax business stuff. Um, Cool. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I'm, I think I'm gonna schedule a webinar about legal stuff with subscription boxes. Um, so I will definitely take that that feedback into consideration, Jason. Um, you don't need a formal contract. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys for the these comments here. Um, how often do I repeat a product type? Um, I I try not to repeat a product type every month. So I might have candle every other month or every other two months. Um, um, so question, if you're sourcing products outside of the U.S., do you suggest an importer versus contacting the manufacturer? Um, I mean, I would con I, I work with the manufacturer the, the two times I've done it, and I just use DHL or something like that. Um, so how to remove one-off boxes, subscribe, and cancel immediately from, uh, from your churn rate? Um, you can't remove that from your churn rate in the creator dashboard, but you can export the stuff as a CSV and then manually pull those things out. Um, the other thing that I might suggest, Andrew, is... Um, you know, I think actually Creature just did this. They're gaining people now, so they have to give you reasons around why they canceled. Um, and so that hopefully will actually prevent some cancellations. But to do the math, you just have to manually export the CSV and then create graphs yourself. Um, when will Creature integrate PayPal? I'm not really sure. Hopefully soon. Um, to be totally honest with you, I mean, people want to use PayPal so they can dispute charges easier against us. Um, so usually we, I think that's one of the reasons why we haven't been doing that is because it's actually better for our vendors because they won't, won't be hit with so many fees and a lot of people think that they need it, but a lot of people end up subscribing anyways. Um, uh, but I, I will hit the, I will, I'll let the team know. I do think it's in the pipeline soon. How can I get lower than wholesale pricing since I'm not selling retail? Tasha, um, we kind of covered that over the webinar. I might suggest checking out the webinar, uh, you know, product sourcing for subscription boxes or just wait a couple of days until this is up, up on subscription school. You don't need a variety of box sizes. Who do you who do I use for credit card process, processing? That I use Stripe. Um, I have outsourced fulfillment, and I've never touched a box myself for Prosperly. Um, the way I did that for Escape Monthly, when we packed for the first seven months inside of our own facility, um, I went to the, the fulfillment center, I spoke to the people, established a relationship with them, and all I had to do the next month was just change my shipping address. Um, 
So, you know, find a, find a fulfillment partner who knows what they're doing. I suggest Northwest Paper Box, but there are very, there's a lot of other ones like Pack Lane and um, just, just some other, um, other good, uh, other good fulfillment and shipping services that you can use this, through the uh, resources section on subscription school. Um, okay. So uh, thanks again for everybody. I can't get the last couple of questions here. Um, but thank you again for attending. I'm going to go ahead and, and stop the recording now. If you could just answer that survey on your way out, let, let me know what you want to cover next. And again, this Thursday, we're going to have another uh, webinar on early customer acquisition. So getting your customer numbers up. So stay tuned to the Facebook wall on Cratejoy. And I'm going to be posting an update for that uh, in just a couple of minutes. So I'm going to post a status update right now that has an invitation for Friday's web, or excuse me, Thursday's webinar, which will be at the same time we have today. Um, thanks, everybody, again. Uh, if you have any other questions or any other comments, feel free to email me at jesse at creatureware.com, and I'll be happy to chat with you. Um, have a great rest of your evening, and best of luck with your boxes.